Artwork is often bought ready-made. The artist makes a piece of sculpture or painting. An art shopper sees it and decides it will go nicely above their couch, let's say, so buys it from the artist or more likely from a gallery. Commissioned artwork is different. Commissioned work is created specifically for a person or a place. While making any art can be hard work, making commissioned art has very specific challenges. The artist Monica Setzel Phillips talks about this. The challenge is in this kind of a commission to somehow incorporate the desires of the committee for the community, speaking for the community, and your own artistic integrity and your own creativity. Making art is often a private creative experience. Developing a public space, such as a government building, is very much a community activity. Public commissioned artwork is, therefore, both a solitary activity of the artist and, like any governmental activity, a public process. This article is an exploration of how these two contradictory endeavors come together to create a piece of public art. Specifically, this is the story of Monica Setzel Phillips' creation for the new McMinnville Civic Hall. Well, I know of two other people in the world who put fiber and wood together, one in England and then a team uh, where one artist does the weaving, one artist does the wood in New Zealand. And um, it's very interesting. I, of course, I owe a lot to my father uh, for my interest in wood. I started out as a weaver. And then I saw these scraps in my dad's shop and I thought, oh, well, you know, I could carve a stick and it would look nice to hang the weaving from a stick. And so I did that for quite a while. And uh, then I thought, oh, you know, I could carve sticks and put them in the weaving. And I did some of that. And then about, what was it, about 86, 1986, um, all of a sudden, and it's very, one of my very most favorite quotes um, is one of Albert Einstein. And he said, if you are patient, there may come that day when suddenly while eating an apple, the solution politely presents itself and says, here I am. And I wasn't eating an apple, but that is what happened. I, and I don't think he meant you sit around and wait for it to descend upon you. What he meant is if you, are, if you work at something uh, and you're persistent and you're patient with it, then that day will come. And that definitely what happened to me. All of a sudden it was there. I, I, I can, and I remember it was before I went to bed one night. I suddenly saw the two together. And uh, that was a very, very exciting moment for me. I love color. I love playing with color and weaving provides me that opportunity. And weaving is also constructive. You are forming your fabric by adding to, and sculpture is destructive uh, because you have to take away to reveal the form. And so that forms a kind of completion for me that is, that is very rewarding. And I should mention that I have, to, I have to do the weaving first. I don't design one and then design the other. I design the two together. but. I do the weaving first and then the wood carving because I have to excavate that channel where the weaving is going to go. And so I need that measurement. So I want it to be fairly subdued, but I want there to be, as you can see, you can see the colors uh, emerge. So you take you take the character of your colors and the character of your wood into account. One choice leads to another choice leads to another choice. And so it's like putting the puzzle together to see how it all fits. Bringing images and concepts to life in wood is not easy. Monica talks about some of the challenges and techniques of sculpting in wood. You laminate a little bigger uh, than the size that you want and then you 
trim it because when you laminate your ends are not it's not going to be perfect on the ends and then what I do next um, just because I've learned to be patient um, is to do the edges all around first and get that out of the way because once you've made a cut it's a little harder to surface that then I sketch what's going to happen and then I use the circular saw and next step is to rough out where the weaving's going to go make sure that's all okay I rough it out with a circular saw you have to just you make it's it's very tedious you make many many small cuts and then you you actually hit them with a mallet uh, this will be used for outlining that so and it actually works better if you do it that way see you see that so you do that all the way around and take it down a little ways the thing is when you surface you have to find what's the right direction to surface from and sometimes you're pushing forward and you're going that way and sometimes you're going this way and pulling back depending on what the wood wants to do so that's where I, I see this as um, a collaboration with the wood because you you have a certain amount of say but the wood has a certain amount of say and you can only impose your will to a certain extent and then you have to listen to what the wood tells you it it's willing to do surfacing is fun to do some boards are more dense and harder to carve the other thing about uh, carving a softer wood soft wood is not very forgiving and so you have to make sure your tools are sharp and that there aren't any nicks or anything because it'll show up immediately in the cut you know all of this I owe a deep debt of gratitude to my dad um, because that's how I I've basically learned the old technique of watching him do it so these are the sharpening stones that you put a slight amount of pressure on your tool as you go forward and you roll it slightly because the tool is slightly has a slight bubble and then you just slide it back so the pressure is the down forward and then back down forward and then back and you do that until you feel that you've raised a little burr and then you take I use this and then you just run it over the stone so that and then you have to feel it so you have to develop sensitivity in your fingers uh, so then you can feel whether the burr's gone and whether the tool's sharp uh, being able to sharpen a tool well just takes takes time you know most people say you must have a lot of chisels and there's a popular misunderstanding uh, wood carvers are mostly not chiselers <laughs> mostly mostly you have gouges and gouges can be anything from a U to a V to a very flat gouge that's barely got a bevel to it but it has a slight bevel this fan shape is also very very useful I love that tool that's a very very useful tool and good tools are of course expensive so you can't um, you can't chintz on your on your equipment that just doesn't work out one of the discoveries I made uh, doing the very first panel for this because uh, I haven't done so many Alaska yellow cedar panels um, was that importance of making uh, vertical cuts or cross grain cuts before doing with grain cuts and so that was an important lesson so there's always something that you can learn every time you're every time you're dealing with wood I'd like to say publicly that for me it's a, uh, a real honor to be chosen for this commission and to do this work and it's kind of um, a very special honor because also a piece of work of my father's was purchased to go in the building so so that that's a very wonderful thing one of the rewards of such a commission is that the public is seeing the space and that many people will see it and getting back to my father what really made his career is when he did the carvings for Salishan 
Before that, it was really a big struggle. He had had a few, uh, mostly work for architects, but much smaller in scale. And so when he finally did those Salishan panels, his career just took off. My father always said, um, you know, get your work out there, and if you have to sell, initially, if you have to sell it cheap, sell it cheap. If you have to give some of it, give some of it away. Because until the public, it's only when the public, whether it's an individual or a group, um, responds to your work that you have that communication that you need as an artist to go forward. I think, you know, with Monica's piece, because it's not representational, it allows for a lot of interpretation. And there will be um, a little um, pamphlet that will talk about what each piece um, what her intention was, what ruin or what historical significance it has, so that people can get a more specific understanding of the piece. But I think what you really want is a piece that will um, give anyone an opportunity to interpret and to be part of the continuum of creativity. This is one of the most important symbols. This, this is the millstone. And the symbol, uh, the reason that's important is because the millstone is a symbol for equal justice under the law. And since this, is a, this room serves as mun municipal court, that's an important concept. And then, of course, this is, represents the family. So it's a, the two together is, a, is an important combination. I'm always humbled by um, earlier people uh, who were responsible for developing and keeping alive arts and crafts uh, to this day because they were doing it for the love of doing it. And that's an important ingredient. You have to have that love. Uh, I, I believe that's essential and it needs to be in your work. Um, and what we're losing is, because there's so little art in the schools, is we're losing that broad base of many people, say, weaving or painting or embroidering. The most important thing is that we realize the value of having good art in public places. Um, that's essential. If we want our culture to survive and develop, uh, then, then that has to happen. And I think more people are beginning to understand that, that it enriches us all and how valuable, how necessary the arts are and how valuable they are to our lives. Mm -hmm.